Unfortunately, our Dean Anna Maya Poikkeus is unable to attend today, and I will be taking her place in, in hosting this webinar today. My name is Jenny Salminen, and I work as a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Teacher Education at the University of Jyväskylä. Just a few opening words before we proceed to our presentations. So as you are probably aware, uh, Global Innovation Network for Teaching and Learning India is a network in which Finnish higher education institutions, together with their partners from India, co-create research-based solutions to global educational challenges and collaborate in research and education. The network is also seeking opportunities to facilitate staff and student mobility initiatives between Finland and India in educational sciences and teacher training. The network was initiated with the funding by the Ministry of Education and Culture of Finland and is coordinated by the University of Jyväskylä in Finland. The Nordic Centre in India, on the other hand, is a consortium of leading universities and research institutions in Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway and Sweden, established in 2001 with the objective to facilitate cooperation in research and higher education between the Nordic countries and India. Uh, NCI facilitates and supports a wide range of study and research activities in India and in the Nordic countries. This uh, is the fourth webinar of the Promoting Indo-Finnish Collaboration in Teaching and Learning, a webinar series for academia and practitioners. And the gener generic aim of the webinar series is to bring together Finnish and Indian academics and practitioners from the field of education. In these webinars, Indian and Finnish experts share their knowledge and good practices on different educational topics. Today's interesting theme, approaches to child-centered pedagogy in early childhood education and care, is particularly important for at least two reasons. Firstly, early childhood education and care forms a solid foundation and first steps on the path of lifelong learning, along with facilitating sustainable and equal opportunities for the children in the broader society. Secondly, the centrality of children's agency, child perspectives and active participation have been recognized as central values and leading principles of children's learning and development. Consequently, the broad concept of child-centered pedagogy seems particularly useful in examining these affordances in ECEC pedagogy. Uh, today, we have a great privilege of hearing four interesting presentations from esteemed experts in the field. During the first hour of the webinar, we will hear two presentations of 20 minutes, followed by around 10 minutes time slot for questions and comments. And then during the second half, of the webinar. Similarly, we have two 20-minute speeches and the webinar will be concluded with around 10 minutes time slot for questions and comments. I will do my best in maintaining the, the time frame and, and I will also briefly introduce each of the presenters. So perhaps without a further ado, I will now present the first speaker who is Sunisha Ahova, and Sunisha is an education specialist with UNICEF India, currently leading UNICEF India's work in the area of foundational learning, including early childhood education, supporting national and state governments in 14 states. She provides technical support to the Ministry of Women and Child Development and Ministry of Education, Government of India. Sunisha has been working in the education sector for three decades, working with several national and international civil society organizations, including working with Mobile Crash and Care India. She has also worked as a consultant to the Ministry of Education, Government of India, focusing on out-of-school children, especially child workers and urban deprived children and early language and literacy learning programs. So, with this introduction, Sunisha, the floor is yours. Much and good morning, good afternoon uh, to all of those who are here with us today uh, for this webinar series. And I'm really grateful to the organizers 
for inviting me to come and share with all of you uh, about early childhood care and education in India. Uh, and as was uh, mentioned in my introduction, uh, I work with colleagues, uh, my UNICEF colleagues in 14 states and with UNICEF's mandate to support, to provide technical support to the national and state government. Uh, in my presentation, I will try and provide the context in which uh, child-centered pedagogy uh, is kind of attempted to be implemented. Uh, and I'll primarily be focusing on uh, government provisioning of early childhood care and education in India. Uh, so I just I just want to kind of set the uh, context of uh, my presentation by sharing with you. And uh, and I'm really coming from the fact that I'm not uh, sure how much about the in the way uh, governance in India is actually done and how the early childhood care and education programs are implemented in India. So uh, in my first few slides, I'll talk about that and then talk about a research uh, that uh, UNICEF supported uh, and what were some of the uh, interesting insights we got around uh, child centered pedagogy. Uh, I will talk about that. So uh, to start with, you know, uh, India has had a very large integrated early childhood development program uh, that's more than four decades old, uh, which was started in 1975. And I'm like, I'm largely going to focus on that particular program. Uh, in the in the more recent years, I would like to say that India passed uh, a right to education act. Uh, making education, school education for children six to 14 years uh, free and compulsory. Uh, however, this particular act does not cover children in the age group of three to six years. So while education is a fundamental right for children six to 14 years, it is the intent of the state or the government to provide free early childhood care and education to all children three to six year old. Uh, in 2013, uh, India adopted a national early childhood care education policy, and this policy covered children below the age of six years. Uh, and now recently, in 2020, India has actually uh, adopted a new national education policy after almost three decades. And this policy covers children in the age group of 3 to 18 years. So this is for the first time, uh, you know, the entire continuum of the age of 3 to 8 years, which is globally also acknowledged as a continuum of learning, uh, is now recognized uh, and is also uh, referenced as the foundational stage of learning. So uh, this is just to kind of give you an overview of the policy framework for uh, within which early childhood care and education program provisioning is happening in India. Uh, just wanted to also tell you about, you know, what are the modalities of uh, provisioning of uh, uh, preschool education or early childhood education in India? We have multiple models. We have government provisioning. We have private sector provisioning. Uh, so one of the largest programs uh, that we have in India, which is a government run program, uh, these are ECD centers. There are 1.4 million ECD centers in India, uh, and these centers provide six services. Uh, one of the six services includes preschool education, and these are referred to as Anganwadi centers or play centers within the community. Uh, we have schools that have pre-primary sections, but the again, uh, the duration of the pre-primary uh, or preschool education program across states in India uh, is different. It could be a one-year preschool program. It could be a two-year preschool program. And not all schools have this pre-primary uh, provisioning. Uh, and then, of course, we have the standalone private preschools. Uh, there is a very robust, large, uh, private sector and moving forward, as I will show you the data, uh, there is a very large percentage of children uh, in the age group of three to six years 
uh, who go to these private preschools and the reasons for parents to send their children to these private schools. We'll talk about that in the uh, following slides. OK, so uh, I'm now going to talk to you about a study that uh, UNICEF supported. Uh, and this study was done in collaboration with a university uh, in Delhi, uh, where there is a center for early childhood care and education and development, along with Asar Center and Samyukta represents uh, that organization. Uh, and this particular study actually followed 14,000 children. It's a longitudinal study. Uh, which followed 14,000 children from age 4 to age 8 across three different geographies in the country. The idea behind the study was one to understand the the uh, you know the extent of access to early childhood education services. Two, it was to look at the quality of the services that children are uh, getting. What are some of those good practices that are also happening? Uh, not, uh, you know, uh, to kind of identify what could be those components of good practices that we need to really uh, bring into the mainstream system. So what did this study tell us? And this is a study which happened between uh, 2012 to 2017. And it's a very large study. We have not had a study of this scale in India uh, so far. So uh, it had uh, it gave us a lot of good insights. One, the fact that uh, the government provisioning of uh, preschool education was universal. Uh, the 1.4 million centers that we have. They really cover the length and breadth of the country. They are centers that are located in very remote uh, inaccessible areas. Uh, each of these centers has two uh, people. Uh, so there is an Anganwadi worker who's the ECD worker and a helper. Uh, and they are both kind of community workers. They're from the same community and uh, they, uh, they provide all the six services which include supplementary nutrition, uh, immunization, as well as preschool education. Uh, the other thing that was evident in this uh, study was that uh, that there were 70% uh, children were actually enrolled somewhere uh, in some kind of a preschool facility. And there was also already a lot of private provisioning that was uh, coming up in different states. And this private provisioning varied across the states, some states having much more compared to other states. Uh, so this was something that was uh, a very positive picture to us in terms of that most children were really enrolled. Uh, however, we still had the last mile, the most vulnerable, the most marginalized children from the most economically weaker homes that are still not enrolled in any programs. Uh, the other very interesting uh, finding from this study, and this is again, you know, related to the context in India. Uh, in India, while preschool age group is seen as three to six years, and like I said, the right to education said that the age of entry to class one should be six years plus. Uh, however, given that we are a federal structure, state, while the national government provides uh, frameworks and guidance, states do have the flexibility to take their own decisions. So we still have several states in India and two of the states in this study, Rajasthan and Telangana, the age of entry into primary school is five years. Uh, so children do not necessarily attend a three year preschool education program before they join uh, grade one. Uh, and 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 the trends, the the kind of trends that we saw was uh, that you know if we actually look at children in the age group of three and four years in some states, three and four year olds don't go to any preschool. Uh, so just to kind of pick up pick up an example of one of the states, Rajasthan, uh, you will find that uh, at age five, most children are enrolled somewhere. 
uh, it could be a primary school or it could be a preschool. And what this study really told us and which you will see in my data in the next slide, uh, the enrollments kind of started to stabilize. The enrollment kind of start to stabilize around the age of eight. So you may go into a school where there are a lot of younger age group children who are sitting in grade one. Uh, and this is this kind of a mixed pres mixed age presence is more prevalent in government schools as compared to private schools, because private schools often have a preschool education program before children get into uh, primary classes. Uh, so here is uh, data from another report, which is called the Asar report. This is an annual survey that is done in rural parts of India. Uh, and this is data from 2018, uh, which provides an age wise, you know, uh, kind of overview of where children at which different age ages are enrolled. Uh, and here I just like to kind of point out to you a few very significant data points. Uh, please note that at age five, 27 percent children are already in private preschools and about 24 percent children, five year olds are actually in government schools and they are in grade one. Uh, you will also note that at age three, there are about 29% children who are not enrolled in any preschool or school. Uh, even at age four, about 15% children are not enrolled in preschool or schools. And one of the challenges that we face in uh, our school system is that uh, there is a large percentage. In fact, a recent data points out that it's only 50% children in grade one who come with some preschool experience. Uh, rest of the 50% children have not really attended any preschool uh, before they have joined grade one. Uh, this is an enrollment trend of children in grades across grades. And as, as was evident in the previous table also, you can see that there are 22% children in grade one who are below the age of five years. Uh, and that makes it very challenging uh, for teachers uh, because teachers are really kind of trained to transact a grade one curriculum and children in those classrooms are not developmentally ready uh, for uh, participating uh, in a very formal curriculum. Uh, uh, that that's being transacted in class one. Uh, now let's look at the quality of preschool education. And if you're talking about child centered pedagogy uh, in preschool education programs, uh, like I said, this particular study looked at uh, what is the kind of quality of programming children are really uh, accessing. Uh, this study, we looked at both the government ECD centers as well as private preschools. And what was really disturbing in terms of uh, what came out from this data, that about 18% of the time in a government preschool program and about 40% of the time in a private preschool was being spent on teaching of formal three hours. So there was a lot of focus on reading, writing, rote memorization. Uh, there was very little that was being done around storytelling or free play activities, which are really the cornerstone of a developmentally appropriate, uh, age appropriate program that should really be implemented with children in the age group of three to six years. And here I'd also like to kind of flag another issue. Uh, the ECD programs that uh, the ECD centers where children attend the preschool education program, uh, the Anganwadi worker or the ECD worker, she's kind of providing six services, uh, which includes immunization, supplementary nutrition. She's also reaching out to pregnant and breastfeeding, uh, pregnant women, mothers who are breastfeeding their babies. She has to do health education with them. So she's somebody who's a multitask worker and therefore how much time and effort she's really able to put into 
uh, a preschool education program uh, that has been a challenge and several studies have actually pointed out to us uh, that uh, one on an average less than an uh, you know less than 90 minutes per day are really dedicated to preschool education uh, and that time also is not really enriched with activities that are really uh, you know are developmentally appropriate for children uh, during that period given that this these were some of the uh, you know issues that we are all aware of uh, unicef and and the other thing that this study really also brought out and i'm sure all of you here who are uh, attending this webinar are also very much aware that a good quality preschool education program has a direct correlation to learning in uh, later grades. And this also came out uh, very clearly uh, in this uh, study that we uh, that was done across three different geographies. Uh, what was also, uh, you know, what was also a finding from this study given the poor quality of programming that was being implemented most children at age five uh, were not really ready for school they did not have the school readiness uh, abilities um, and therefore they had a more challenging start uh, when they uh, joined uh, formal learning so sure thank you so much so, uh, like I said, significant positive association between the quality of a program and school readiness levels. And what was very, very evident was that the formal teaching of reading, writing uh, actually had a negative impact on school readiness scores uh, for children. Uh, so, given this context, you know, uh, it was it was important for all of us, uh, uh, you know, to really think that what are the kind of changes that we'd really like to see uh, happen as part of preschool education, how to make it more child-centered, how to make it more developmentally appropriate, uh, and move away from the fact that there is this very high aspiration of uh, getting children to be part of English medium schools uh, and that has been a big challenge and something that is now being kind of addressed through the new national education policy uh, that India has adopted in 2020. Uh, so there have been some really significant changes that have now been adopted as part of our new national education policy. Uh, the policy now acknowledges that three years of preschool uh, along with the first two years at school should be really looked at as a continuum of learning which is now called the foundational stage of learning and a lot of efforts are going on now uh, in terms of making sure that when we are developing the curriculum for this stage we make sure that the curriculum is in is in a continuum uh, and that there is a smooth transition for children from the preschools to uh, early grades uh, within the school. However, what also, you know, and, and uh, one of the big challenge for us at this point of time that we are trying to address is given the different models of preschool education in our country, there are different standards of quality for the program. And how do we make sure that there are certain non-negotiables that will be there for each and every model to be supported uh, because uh, the inputs provided for each of these models are very, very different because each of these programs are also implemented by different ministries uh, for us in India. Uh, so at this point of time, the, the big focus for all of us in India is to ensure the coordination between multiple government departments ensure that that ECC, new ECC curriculum that we make uh, is, uh, you know, uh, developmentally appropriate, uh, is in a continuum and it really focuses. And therefore, how do we do the capacity building of not only those 1.4 million ECD workers, but all those preschool teachers who will probably get uh, hired or recruited as schools start to add new preschool classes uh, in schools. 
and uh, here i have shared links to two particular articles that were published in indian newspapers i will share my presentation and i hope all of you will have access to these uh, newspaper articles because they also highlight some very interesting positive things that are also happening within these centers given all these challenges that we have where several innovations are being tried out how communities are engaging with the centers and i'm sure samyukta will be able to talk about that uh, much more uh, in her presentation and for us at the end of my presentation what i would like to say is the biggest challenge for us at this point of time is how do we make sure that our preschools don't become like schools but our early grades in schools become more like the preschools the play based pedagogy really comes into our school classrooms uh, rather than our preschools becoming like school classrooms thank you so much thank you very much tunisha for your inspirational talk it was very very um educational at least from my perspective i felt that i i learned a lot of new things from the the indian ecec system thank you very much and we i have to remind at this point that we will return to possible questions after the next presentation and uh, the audience can insert their questions to the chat so moving onwards in our program it is my great pleasure to introduce the second presenter of the webinar uh, uh, and, um, and and she is dr kati rintakorpi and she has worked in early childhood education for 30 years as a teacher, kindergarten entrepreneur, leader and educator, and over the recent years implementing the expert of early childhood education, for example, to Asia. But this dissertation dealt with the possibilities of pedagogical documentation in the development of early childhood education uh, and cooperation with families. In her education, Kathy combines her solid practical skills with a theoretical examination in a child-oriented way. Kathy, the floor is yours. About your great presentation, it, it resonated strongly with the Finnish system too, and it's good to continue the quality talk after you. Uh, I'm going to talk about pedagogical documentation as a development tool in early childhood education and care. And this is a topic that we have been discussing quite a lot in Finland during the recent years. So it's quite, quite a hot topic. Okay, I tried to do it again. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Does it work now? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I have two points in this presentation. We will start from discussing the idea of developing early childhood education and care. And to be able to develop something, we, of course, first need to know where we are now. Related to that question, we need to know where we want to go. What are our goals? And thirdly, we need to find out what needs to be done to get from point A to point B. To formulate the answer, I'll match up the tool of pedagogical documentation in the development process uh, of early childhood education and care, ECEC. 
usually the curriculum serves us uh, as our map in the terrain of teaching and learning. However, we need to ask if the map is working as uh, did Sunisha also in, in her presentation. The world is changing fast and so are the requirements of knowledge. Do we teach and learn the 21st century skills, which are quite different from the skills we needed yesterday? Is our curriculum up to date? Also, there are many levels in the curriculum. Does the national or local curriculum serve every children, every child in my class? Am I able to implement the curriculum in a way which talks to each one of them? Can we answer to their, uh, their needs and areas of interests in a child-oriented way? Or do we hang to the ideas of the old world, believing that we can transfer the best knowledge to children if they just listen and sit down quietly? The curriculum should be the framework for quality. It's based on the values of the society. The curriculum steers the educators to focus on the things which are valued. Values tell about what good early childhood education should aim at and how the daily work is done. Accordingly, values guide all activities and express the perception of even good life and good society. When we talk about the quality, we face the fact that among the educators, parents and children, there are many different views on, uh, on what is high quality early childhood education and care. We have subjective views based on our earlier experiences, levels, level of education and worldview. Our views also uh, are value based. For example, a religious teacher thinks that education should include praying and an atheist cannot accept it. Maybe our curriculum has something to say about it, as in Finland. Uh, the views on quality also change in time and culture. What is valued in Finland is not necessarily valued in India. According to Na uh, Finnish National Education Evaluation Center, the understanding about what is considered as high level or acceptable level of quality in early childhood education uh, should be constructed together in a joint conversation between the educators, also the parents and children. To organize these discussions is one of the most important tasks of the kindergarten manager. This is how they should implement their pedagogical leadership. How can we assess the quality of early childhood education and care? In Finland, we don't evaluate children in daycare. Educators use self-assessment to evaluate the activities and their work in relation to what their understanding about the quality is. Kindergarten is not a factory. And in the end of the day, we cannot count how many unbroken boxes, packages we got today from the assembly line. Rather, kindergarten is a library of people, feelings, ideas, cultures, knowledge, skills and incidents. How can we, uh, we uh, assess the quality of them? Uh, the Latin word, word assidere means sitting by someone 
And that's what is our goal in early childhood education and care assessment and development work in Finland. The teachers take their colleagues, children and parents to sit on the same bench and having multi-perspective discussion which steers the development work. However, we need some tools to help us to collect and record information in order to remember, analyze and understand what is going on in our work and in children's lives and learning. The tool is called pedagogical documentation. The background of pedagogical documentation is in uh, educational sciences, especially early childhood education and care. To conceptualize pedagogical documentation, we can say that the documentation means creating the material for the pedagogical development process. When we document, we take photos, fill out forms, interview children, collect their drawings into their folders and so on. We actually collect traces about what is going on. And only when we start to utilize those documents in our pedagogical work, we move to the area of pedagogical documentation. That's when we sit on the bench together with children, colleagues and parents, open the folders and talk about the pictures, photos and results of the interviews. We ask, what can we learn through the documents? What is the current state of things? What issues or ideas are peeping behind the documents? How can we utilize our findings in planning and implementing our work with these children and these families? How do their perspectives resonate with the official curriculum, the framework of quality? Being a teacher is like being a researcher. The teachers should have their feelers up at every turn in order to recognize the emerging issues in the class and in the community. The teachers should be able to collect data in their class and analyze it together with children, parents and colleagues. According to the results, the curriculum of the class uh, should be developed all the time. Pedagogical documentation uh, is a method for making learning visible, listening to children's voices, reflecting and sharing everyday activities and understanding what is going on in children's learning. Pedagogical documentation makes the process of planning and assessment systematic and helps the educators to focus on the most essential factors. Pedagogical documentation is an everyday method which is used together with children and parents because children construct their learning in cooperation with others, the environment and different things and phenomena they encounter. Supported by pedagogical documentation and curriculum, the teachers formulate objectives which are flexible and adapted to the interests and needs of children. This means that the practical everyday curriculum emerges in the dialogical relationship between the child, the children, the teacher, the parents and the community. The process of pedagogical documentation is open and allows different perspective, pers perspectives. Uh, it's part of the daily learning activities uh, of children and also adults. For example, children and adults can take photos when the group has a trip to the forest or they can shoot short videos about the games and other activities. 
Next morning or in the end of the week, children and educators stop by the documents and discuss them. They assess together the activities, share how some difficult thing was solved or an idea invented. The documents support their memory and collect things together. With the support of the documents, they can draw conclusions, express their thoughts and feelings, and plan together how to continue with some topic or learning project. Pedagogical documentation can gradually collect the pieces of some learning project and, uh, and show the process of learning in the walls of the kindergarten. Before the documents are shared with children, the educators do preliminary analysis to the mass of documents to dig out the diamonds which possibly bring, bring forth the, the learning process of children. Accordingly, the process of pedagogical documentation is not neutral uh, and we need to recognize it. The, the ethical problem might be that we use documents to manipulate children or parents, for example, to sh uh, share only those documents uh, which make us look clever and competent in the eyes of the parents. It is also possible that instead of increasing children's participation in planning and assessing the, as, uh, the activities, we put children uh, to the showcase and step into their personal, personal area without respect. That's nice. <laughs> uh, early childhood education and care uh, is an environment full of almost invisible and fast changing situations, encounters, feelings and insights. The visible activities have a meta level in the participants' personal learning and experiences. By using pedagogical documentation, we have some possibilities to collect the traces which can steer our work as educators in the fa fast-paced reality in relation with our students' lives. We need to remember that pedagogical documentation uh, does not uh, prove evidence of something. It's a subjective tool. However, it gives us hints about what might be the best building material for the learning and well-being of these children in this class today. Uh, when the proposals uh, we get by discussing the documents are set into relation with our curriculum and quality framework, we get more information about where to focus, what methods to use and how to adjust our physical, psychological and social learning environments to enhance the quality of early childhood education and care. Thank you. Great to have this talk with you today. Amazing. Uh, thank you very much, Kati, for this uh, very inspirational talk. It was lovely to hear about the details of pedagogical documentation and curriculum. Um, as we proceed in the program, we now have uh, a couple of minutes, maybe 10 minutes, a bit more than that, to discuss uh, the questions from the audience. And there are actually um, two questions, one for uh, Sunisha and one for Kati. So perhaps I will read both the questions aloud and then you can choose in which order you would like to reply. So the, the question for Sunisha was, um, in your opinion, what would it require from Indian early childhood education to increase and support play-based learning? And, and how do you think that the NEP will address the gap in terms of availability of trained ECEC teachers 
and how do you think ECEC teachers can be integrated into the present Angwadi system? Also, is there a mode to assess the delivery of ECEC and ensure its quality across India? And um, for for Kati, the question is, how can the progressive system of pedagogical reporting work in a larger and more complex setting like India? And there are also a bit further questions for Kati re with regard to Finnish ECEC system. So what are the major challenges Finland faces in ECEC? And how climate change is projected in early childhood curricula? So maybe I will just give you the floor and, and please feel free to, to respond. So sure. thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, both the questions are very relevant and very important. Uh, and I think uh, the new national education policy uh, for us uh, is an opportunity to really revisit our early childhood education program uh, design, the content, the modes of delivery, the quality standards. Uh, and one, you know, one interesting data point that I'd like to again share here. There was a study done by World Bank uh, almost uh, more than a decade back, uh, which pointed out that uh, India spends uh, a very small percentage of its GDP uh, on uh, early childhood care and education. And even after more than a decade, uh, if we look at our financial provisioning for early childhood care and education, uh, we haven't really made a very significant progress in that area. Uh, so uh, the f and and given the scale of the work, uh, the, you know the the numbers like the numbers that I mentioned, uh, uh, we we're talking about millions of children and millions of ECD workers. Uh, what we really need is a very strong institutional framework uh, that would actually be able to support uh, in terms of not only developing the ECC curriculum or as well as, uh, you know, uh, capacity building programs for uh, preschool teachers, uh, you know, currently in India, uh, given this large size that we have, we only have 250 institutions uh, that provide a two year preschool uh, teacher education program. Uh, and which means we only get about 10,000 preschool uh, trained teachers every year. Uh, and very quickly, these teachers actually get absorbed by the private sector. Now that the government has started to kind of acknowledge uh, that preschool education is very much part of a school learning kind of continuum. Uh, I, I, I am very positive that this is, you know, strengthening our existing institutions, expanding the institutional framework for developing more preschool teachers who have the uh, training uh, to implement preschool education programs will be a priority for us moving forward. Uh, and in terms of integrating these preschool trained teachers into Anganwadi centers, uh, the last point that I'd like to really make is one of the big advocacy at this point of time that's happening through civil society organizations, including, you know, uh, UNICEF and other partners is to try and get the government to commit for a dedicated ECC teacher within the ECD centers. Uh, because there are studies that have shown us that if we have a dedicated person for preschool education, it really has a significant impact on the quality of preschool education. Uh, as what I had mentioned in the models, there are some of these ECD centers that are uh, physically located within schools. Uh, one of the attempts that's being done currently uh, with about 38 
and working very closely with uh, the ECD, the Anganwadi worker and the teacher. And we hope that, you know, uh, we've had we've set very ambitious goals for ourselves in the country based on the new education policy. And I hope that we'll be able to also get the government to increase its investment in the area of preschool education so that we are really able to bring uh, all of those pieces together. And last uh, piece, uh, yes, UNICEF, along with a few partners, has created certain tools to uh, address this issue of quality. Uh, and we've tried and we piloted it in a few locations and we are still trying to kind of improve upon that tool so that it becomes more like a coaching and a mentoring tool for the person who's uh, delivering the service rather than an inspection kind of a model uh, that often kind of gets uh, uh, implemented more easily than not. Thank you. Thank you, Sunisha. Uh, there is another request for you, um, a question whether it's possible to share a link to research behind the chart of school readiness in your presentation. So maybe you can share the link um, as instructed in the in the um, speaker chat. And in terms of having equal time for both presenters, I will now um, hand the floor to Kati to respond to your questions. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you for the questions. They are not easy, of course, <laughs> easy to answer. Uh, the first question or one of the questions is that how can the progressive system of pedagogical reporting work in larger and more complex settings like India? It would be interesting to talk with you about this topic, but I have some ideas or maybe not answers but some ideas um, uh, each educator and the educator team the kindergarten staff works with these children in this class in this kindergarten despite the size of the country on the or the size size of the popular popular how many people there are there are always the individuals who are related with each other in education. So uh, it's not a problem to bring the uh, method of pedagogical documentation to, to that process between people and, and the kindergarten environments. But of course, it's a question of uh, educating, e educating the teachers and other educators, also the parents. And maybe the most difficult thing also in Finland is to help or support the educators to change their mindset, to start to think in, an, in a child-oriented way uh, and to uh, be ready to open their uh, working practices through pedagogical documentation because it's of course it's challenging to suddenly show what we do and open it for the uh, discussion with the parents or children or so so yeah maybe i an answer like this and about the finnish system i think may maybe two of you will be talking something about this too uh, so uh, the the main challenges right now <laughs> are that we don't have enough kindergarten teachers and other kindergarten staff. So uh, it's a bit hypocrite. It's 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 not very nice to talk about high quality and what do you need to do to get the high quality if we actually we don't have enough people in the field doing the job so that's definitely the the main problem about the climate change i think it's quite well written in, in into our curriculum uh, in the transversal competence areas which we are teaching to children the climate change is not written there literary but uh, children are practicing and learning many skills that support 
them to grow up as adults who can do something, hopefully, for this really bad situation. Uh, then about the, the uh, allocation of the government, the government actually pays most of the fees of early childhood education and care. The parents pay a small amount of the the fee daycare fee, and it's also it it also depends on the incomes of the family. Some families don't pay anything, and uh, in the whole Finland, uh, the pre-primary education for those children who are six years old it's free for the families and also in many uh, municipalities also for five years of uh, old children the, the education is free so it's strongly supported by the government okay maybe i could give you some kind of answers. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I am sure that the audience got, got what they wanted. Um, I'm noting that there are only a few minutes left for, th for the question and answer session. However, there are still a couple of questions in the chat. So I suggest that, um, especially Sunisha, there are questions for you still remaining in the chat, which we don't have quite enough time to go through. So maybe you can try to see if they are something that you can quite a, uh, briefly respond to the audience through the chat. But moving on with our program, we still have two very interesting and fascinating presentations on board. And I'm sure that Tuovis and, and some, some Shukdas uh, presentations will add to what we have heard from, from Kathy and Sunisha. So I will briefly present our third speaker, Tuovi Valle, who is an expert in early childhood education and learning. Tuovi currently works as a university teacher and educates future early childhood educators at the University of Jyväskylä, Finland. She has worked in early childhood education for over 10 years as a teacher and as an educator. And Tuovi has gained a very strong international experience while working in Qatar, Nepal and Vietnam. Education export projects are familiar to her as well as teacher training and education in emergencies. Tuovi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kati. Can you hear me? I think yes. OK. So uh, it's great to be here and thank you for Shunisa and Kati and I will continue and I'm talking about the importance of play in Finnish early childhood education today and I'm going to start talking a little bit about the history and overall about the Finnish early childhood education and then we move on about the play and importance of it and I have very practical things to show you. Sorry, I can't. Here. OK, so a little, uh, little bit about the history of the early childhood education in Finland. So the first daycare center opened in 1888, and it was also the first one in the Nordic countries. And only four years later, uh, we started 1892, we started uh, the early childhood education teacher, teacher training in Finland. And it was also the first training that started in the Nordic countries. Then uh, the, the government um, came with it in 1927, when the daycare center started to get some subsidy um, from the government, from the state, if there were at least 25 children in a group and their day lasted at least four hours and the teacher had to have an early childhood education training. Then uh, in 1973, uh, that was a big year for Finland, the first 
uh, daycare legislation in Finland called Children's Day Care Act came into force. Then there was a lot of time in between. And in 1995, the training of the early childhood education teachers transferred to the universities. And then that was started that it was only research based early childhood education as well. And then 2001, uh, we started to have the free preschool education for everyone, which means that because the early childhood education, it's not free. Like our basic education in Finland is free. We go to school the year we turn seven, seven years old. So then it's free, but the going to kindergarten, it's not free and the preschool wasn't free before, but on 2001 it became free for everyone and it's four hours of um, free education per day for each child. And then if they need to have a longer day, if the parents are working, then it means that then they will pay the fee for the rest of the day. But the four hours is free for everyone when you are in a preschool. And then the latest a uh, big thing happened in 2018. The, our national core curriculum for early childhood education and care states that the early childhood education teacher has to have a university degree, bachelor's or master's. There are a lot of uh, different titles of educators who are working in the kindergartens, but from 2018 onwards, you have to have a university degree to be called as an early childhood education teacher. And then more about the play. Usually it's quite common that the parent might ask when they are picking up their child from the daycare, they might ask, have you just been playing today? And this is how we are kind of showing them and for everyone how much there is happening when you are just playing. And it kind of all the things you are learning through play. Mo mainly, most the things that you need to be able to do and develop, you, the children, they learn through play. They learn fine motor skills and cross motor skills, a lot of problem solving when you have to play with others, think about how they feel, how you feel, how it makes you feel. If somebody says something, you develop your creativity, your observation skills, you learn a lot about rules and norms and how to follow the rules. You learn how to solve disagreements. Also, your thinking abilities will develop. You get to make uh, you get to practice your friendship skills, you get a lot of joy, your identity develops while you're playing, and all a lot of other things are also happening there while you play. And in our Early Childhood Education and Care Act, and also in the National Core Curriculum for Early Childhood Education. This is how the play shows also in there. So play is very central approach in the early childhood education. We see that it's one of the most important approaches. The main objective for the early childhood education and care is to implement versatile pedagogical activities based on children's play. This is where also the pedagogical document, documentation comes, comes along, what Kati talked about, that we observe children's play and then we take that into consideration when we plan the pedagogical activities. The children, they have the right to play, learn by playing and also enjoy. They cannot be forced activities. They learn to build the understanding of themselves, their identity and the world around them while they play. Play is an activity that motivates the children and brings the joy for them. They learn many skills as we saw on the previous slide at the same time and they gain a lot of new knowledge at the same time. 
And the play is one way of in implementing different areas of learning. And the most, I think one of the most important things is that the play has an absolute value for children. Child doesn't play to learn, but they, but he or she learns by playing. Okay, here we can see one example of an, uh, the daily schedules. They vary between the between the kindergartens and between the groups. In each kindergarten, they can kind of decide their own daily schedule. But of course, the, usually the breakfast, the eating times are similar for everyone. But here you can see that in the morning, uh, children, they arrive to daycare center and then there is play time there. It's usually free play, but there might be as, a, as well as a guided play. I will talk to you about the free play and guided play a little bit later. But they come to the daycare center and then they start to play. Then usually around eight o'clock they have a breakfast and after breakfast there comes a morning circle where we talk about usually what day is it, there might be a child who is presenting what day is it, what kind of weather is it, and then they uh, have some pedagogical activities in small groups, then after that it's out outdoor activities and play again, then lunch nap time and story time after lunch depends on the age of the group so because uh, children usually might have little quiet reading time and play and then the day be uh, begins with the play and different activities then comes afternoon snack and then it's play time again and after indoor play, you usually go outside and then in outdoor activities and play. So this is how we have designed that play. Uh, you can see the play throughout the day and it's there with you almost in every moment throughout the day. And there are, we talk about usually that there are free play and adult-led play. But the free play, voluntary play, means that the children, they have the alternative to decide what they play, what kind of a play they play, the content, where, where the play starts, where it ends, who they are playing with, what kind of materials they will use, and how they will use those materials. They decide like who they are, who are part of the play, they are the ones who make all the important decisions. That's uh, what we talk about when we talk about the free play. And then we have guided play, which means usually adult play, play. It means that the educator, the teacher, or somebody else who works in a kindergarten is the one who is making the decisions of the content of the play, where the play takes place, and which children are playing together. And the guided play, the younger the children are, the more important the guided play are, because the guided play it gives children tools and opportunities for their own free play. And even, we, even when we talk about free play, it doesn't mean that the adults or teachers, they are not involved, they are always involved there. Because even the free play, the children need adult guidance there, especially if they have some disagreements or something else. Remind about the rules, or it might be that they have a little bit adults help in the beginning, and then they will continue the free play by themselves. But adults are always there, present. Okay, here I have a few photos for you about different play moments. Um, this is the first one. Here we have you younger, younger uh, children. They are playing outdoors. I remember they were collecting rocks and they said that they are collecting jewelry for their play. It was free play. And then it you could make it adult-led play, guided play in a way that you would start making questions about the what kind of rocks or jewelry they are collecting and then you could start comparing them together and you could make it also 
uh, guided play in that way. And here is the guided play. The children first they chose some soft toys from inside and then they made snow animals or snow whatever outside of them and it was guided adult led play so they were helping and then the children were making the rest off by themselves and here we can see a snow snow turtle that the children made together and here here are two of my uh, former colleagues uh, this was a long long weeks long play that free play children, one of them brought this to the preschool and they made their own hut. They colored it and painted it and then they played inside for several weeks. So this sometimes even it's a free play and not a guided play, it might take place and it might last for many, many weeks. And the children are the ones who are owning play. Here, these are actually cards that has been used for the pedagogical activities. But when you here, when uh, when you give the children the opportunity to use all the tools and toys you have in the preschool, this is or in the kindergarten, this is what happens. They wanted to play with the sequencing cards on the on the time when they had the pre free play time as well. And here they are sequencing the Very Hungry Caterpillar story cards and they were telling the story to each other. And here uh, the girls were in the first picture on the left side. The girls are playing Measuring, as you can see, there are small building blocks next to the other girls' uh, feet. They were measuring their feet and hands and everything, and that's what they wanted to do on their free play time. And then the adult was also supporting there and asking questions at what you could measure next and questions like that. And then on the other picture, children are playing with matching shape cards. Thank you. Okay, and here uh, the children they wanted. This is uh, the picture is from Qatar, so it was quite hot outside. So the children they wanted to paint the pavement with water, and even it was their free play. But then we were talking about what happens to the water. Where does it disappear? So that's kind of where you can tag along, and then you can learn many, many, many things during the free play. Okay, and here we have a free, free play session and the kids are playing and exploring with different music instruments and then they were playing together and by themselves and making their own songs. And here this was a, you, uh, it's very common that in Finland in kindergarten you have a, like a trip day, maybe once a week, you might take a small trip to the park next door or the forest. Here are, this is a group under three years old. They were playing free play and guided play, some guy uh, climbing and exploring the nature. They were collecting leaves and rocks from outside. And then we were talking about also what, what happens when the fall comes, what happens to the leaves and everything else. Okay. It's very important, I think it's the educator's role uh, when we talk about play and how to make it more centric in the learning and teaching, the, the educator's role is to make sure that there are pedagogical learning or playing areas in the kindergarten. There needs to be some kind of tools for playing, like toys or games, role play outfits, crafting materials, whatever you have. It doesn't have to be new and shiny, but something that the children can use for playing. 
then it's very important to listen to children and their ideas and also inspire children's creativity creativity so it kind of doesn't matter what kind of things you have you can just inspire them and make them use their imagination and then they can build up amazing place thank you thank you very much to all for this very lifelike uh, presentation it was lovely to see the children and their productions and and how it's largely a matter of adult mindset to see the value of the play thank you so much um, i remind the audience to send questions to tuovi we will respond them later on af after the following presentation so we are turning towards the the last presentation of the of today's webinar and I am very pleased to um, welcome the final presenter, Sam Yukta Subramanian, and who is serving as program lead early years at Pratham Education and Foundation, one of India's largest, largest non-profits focused on improving quality of education. She leads the early childhood education and early grades initiatives across many Indian states and has extensive experience working with government officials, private sector partners and non-profit leaders to develop and implement education initiatives. Her focus has been on India's pre-primary education landscape and improving ECEC outcomes at scale. Samyukta holds a bachelor's degree in law and both bachelor's and master's degrees in psychology from the University of Delhi. She joined Pratham in 2008. And with these introduction words, Samyukta, the floor is yours. We still have no visual connection to some of you, so please can you turn on your camera? We can see your presentation, but I can't see you. Yes. At least for me, you are not visible at the moment. To begin, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been such a pleasure listening to all the speakers before me. Um, and I hope to be able to add a little more to everything that's been shared here. Uh, so I'll begin and my presentation is going to be about early years at Pratham, the national education policy and some best practices that we've learned from. I work with the, uh, like you mentioned, I work with the early years team here and early years for us means preschool education as well as grades one and two. So that is why I say early years and not early childhood education. Uh, but as you can understand, it is uh, deeply linked, the two, uh, early, uh, the pre early childhood education and grades one and two. So a little bit about Pratham. Uh, the organization began about 25 years back and we have different verticals, uh, skilling, working with vulnerable children of different age groups, research studies and surveys and education. So today in my presentation, I'll be talking about education and research and advocacy. By that, I mean that I'll be talking about early childhood education and early years in particular, and refer to the ASSER survey uh, that has thrown up a lot of data, which we often refer to in order to understand this age group. Uh, the ASSER survey, as Sunisha mentioned earlier, she used some of the slides from ASSER 
Um, and the survey is a household survey that's done uh, across the country uh, with the age group of 3 to 16 years. And it covers, for example, the 2018 survey covered about 596 districts reaching out to about five and a half thousand children and so we find it nationally representative and so when we look at that data it gives us gives us a picture of the country so how do we look at the early years learning ecosystem at pratham um, for us at pratham when we look at uh, preschool education and early grades we see the child at the center of everything that's happening around him or her uh, so if you look at these uh, boxes, the child is growing, but with adults around him or her. And those adults could be people from the community, they could be teachers, definitely the mother and father, and uh, many others in the community who could be siblings, um, or maybe lots of other people living in my community or neighborhood. And so working with each of these stakeholders who influence the child's life at this early age becomes very important. It's important to shape the growth, the understanding, um, the understanding of play, having children play and learn. All of that comes from the understanding of the adults around the child. And so um, if we look at the parents, we see that parents most often, but typically mothers spend a lot of time with children. And so we work with mothers in order to help uh, them understand what teaching learning at this age is all about. Inside the, inside the classroom, you could have Anganwadi workers or instructors, and these instructors have a very strong influence on children, and the pedagogical processes they use are very important. Um, and so, for example, as was being said before me, you know, how to do free play in class, what are the pedagogical processes to be used? What are the materials? All of that makes a big difference to how the child grows. Um, and with respect to early childhood education, it's a big influence. Uh, in the community, we find that a lot of volunteers often come to the Anganwadis. Uh, the, uh, and uh, they are young people who have a little bit of time and who can often give this time in order to interact with children and do some teaching learning activities with them. We also look at schools, often schools have preschools within them. And so this continuity between preschool and the school. So Nisha mentioned the backward and forward linkages. Uh, these linkages need to be strengthened and need to be uh, uh, looked at very critically. And so this is the learning ecosystem in which the child grows. I think quite often this happens the world over. But thinking about the adults and how to work with them becomes as important as working with the child. That is our understanding. Now, how does this happen? In India, um, uh, across 15 states, Pratham is working with different governments um, as well as directly within communities to reach out to children. Um, the important thing to note here is there are two systems of preschool uh, uh, in India. One is the Anganwadi system and the other is the preschool within schools. So what do we mean by Anganwadis? Anganwadis are community-based preschool centers that are located, that are run by the government and children from the zero to six age group can come into these Anganwadis. And like Sunisha mentioned, there are many services uh, that the Anganwadi offers like health, nutrition, referral services, and also early childhood education. The Anganwadi worker is expected to work with all the children in that class. In contrast, you have schools which have preschools. And so you have children sitting in a preschool or in grade one or in grade two. And this is uh, uh, a little nascent in India because typically many government schools in India began with grade one. So you would have preschool children in Anganwadis and then they would go to schools in grade one. Uh, Pratham partners with these governments uh, across different states, uh, but also across different departments. So the Anganwadi system lies with the de Department of Women and Child Welfare, whereas the school system is with the Department of Education. This is an important difference to note and I'll come back to it uh, later in my presentation. So across the country, we are there with state governments, whether in schools or um, uh, in Anganwadis. Um, and I will talk a little more about how 
we partner with the government in uh, uh, later uh, but it's important to note that whether it is anganwadis or schools the focus is on preschool education and grades 1 and 2 the focus is on working with systems whether with districts uh, in blocks or at the state level so coming to the nep the national education policy india which has already been mentioned earlier i will now be talking a little bit about what the recommendations of the nep are what our learnings and challenges have been and therefore what are the recommendations so if we look at the first uh, thing about the national education policy the policy is extremely uh, important because it has come in um after many many years more than 25 years later we have a national education policy and the policy divides the entire age group um uh, into a few segments uh the policy is a short one but divided into four chapters and the first chapter talks about the foundational um the early childhood care and education being as the foundation of learning so it talks about the 3 to 8 year age group it talks about pre primary and 1 and 2 and then it goes on to talk about grades 3 to 5 6 to 8 and high school education the policy also talks about the fact that if you don't know how to read and do basic math um in the early years by the beginning of grade uh, by the end of grade 3 then you know the rest of the policy is irrelevant for everyone who's trying to uh, get through this education system and so it becomes very important here to understand that the foundations what do we do in the early years uh, will actually determine what happens in later years so this is uh, this is taken from the national education policy and as you can see if we look at the bottom of the pyramid it's two years and three years and that's all foundational learning years um that's three years of preschool and grades 1 and 2 and the policy says a strong base is very important um to ensure overall development this is a departure because the policy in the past has really not talked about the early years the foundational stages in the way that the nep 2020 has uh it's also important to understand that they talk about the age of entry into grade 1 at age 6 but now if we look at the reality if we look at our assert data if we look at what where are children actually going at this age we find a very mixed picture and so the policy what the policy is saying is important but recognizing the challenges that are in front of us given the realities also becomes equally important So, if we look at the data today in India, uh, you see a very varied picture. So, we spoke about Angan Wadis, uh, and you have many children at age three to five going in there. Uh, but we also spoke about preschools within government schools. You have some children going there, and then you have others who are in government schools, which means that these are schools that begin with grade one, and you have children at age five also sitting in grade one. you also have children who are not going anywhere especially at age 3 and 4 they are not going anywhere at all and so this uh, this recommendation that at age 6 children must enter grade 1 looks very very scattered across institutions but also across age groups and so when we look at the age if we look at age 6 we find that in a government school there are only about 50% children who are sitting in uh, at age 6 in grade 1 which is the right place to be and why this emphasis why is it so important to say that you must have children at age 6 and grade 1 it's because we find that some of the data uh, that we have in front of us shows that if you are older and you are sitting in grade 1 the chances of you grasping what is happening in grade 1 are very high uh, this is a small example from a state in punjab just to say that if you if you want to see which children recognize letters by age you will find that older children are able to do it and hence the importance of you know looking at this reality and also at the policy recommendation um to ensure that children actually enter grade 1 by age 6 as of today it's multi age and we need to recognize this and to be able to do this we need legislation in every state to ensure that children actually enter grade 1 by age 6 the other thing to note about the nep is that <clears throat> the early childhood education can be provided in different ways it could be done in separately standing anganwadis 
Anganwadis could be inside government schools. It could be around pre-primary sections within primary schools, or it could be standalone preschools. It could even be private preschools. Now, the thing to note here, especially in our entire government system, uh, is that with every state, we find that the nature of this uh, provisioning looks very, very different. ...part of India. And here we see that maximum children at age three to five are actually in Anganwadis. They then move to government schools by age six to a great extent. But in direct contrast, if you look at the state below, which is a state in the north, Uttar Pradesh, a very popular state, we find that at age three, this number is very, very low uh, for Anganwadis. And it is equally low for other institutions because maximum children seem to not be enrolled anywhere. And so this provisioning, therefore, becomes very important because every state's reality is different. And so um, when we plan and think about what is the provisioning that my state needs and how do I support it? Um, it's so important to look at the data from my state to see where are children really going at this point. Another example is Punjab, where we find that maximum many, many children um, are enrolled, but maximum are going to private institutions. So this is yet another example of where children could be going. So in the first example, we had children going to Anganwadis. In the second, you ha didn't have children enrolled. And in this third example, you have uh, children not, I mean, you have 22% not enrolled at age three, but you also have many children who are not in government systems. So I think the recommendation to be made and the challenge to be overcome is that, you know, we cannot have a rule uh, uh, that fits all. We would need to take into consideration what's happening in every state and then accordingly think about where it is that the strengthening is required. Another thing that the NAP talks about is capacity building. It talks about capacity building of teachers and workers and uh, the kind of certificate courses that should be created uh, so that we can have a professionally qualified system of uh, people who are uh, educators and uh, able to deliver in any setting. But the important point to be kept here, kept in mind here, is that there are uh, many, many challenges as we just saw in terms of the data across the country. And keeping this in mind, the continuity from pre-primary to Anganwadi or primary schooling has to be thought about. So it is not enough to do training of early childhood education separately for Anganwadis and to do it separately for schools, but it is important to look at it together and look at it as pre-primary and grades one and two. Uh, my colleague earlier mentioned uh, about pre-schoolification of the early grades. And I call that the continuum, making sure that children in every grade are give, get, giving, getting the kind of um, inputs that are required. In terms of schooling, in terms of curriculum, in terms of training, and in terms of assessment, I think this continuum has to be kept in mind. Um, so if it's schooling, we have to look at where our children and how are they moving. In terms of curriculum, can the content, if it's about all around development, and all the different activities for play and learning, can that happen across the age group of three to eight? Can the training happen across different departments? And can assessments be in such a way that they are not in silos, but taking into account what children should know before they come in, what they should know before they enter grade one? Uh, I think these are some of the things that we really need to look at closely given our realities. The this is another recommendation of the national education policy, which is that the different departments need to work together. So at the beginning, I mentioned that the Anganwadis are with a different department and the schools are with the education department. And the policy recommends that the departments must work together and they must also work with health and other departments that are connected to early childhood work. <clears throat> And here our recommendation is to make sure that the departments actually work together. Uh, so in meetings, in taking decisions, uh, this collaboration is important, not just at the curricular and training level, but also at the top level where decisions are taken. And that's beginning to happen now in India. And also to make sure that 
after the training, if the training can happen together between the departments in every layer, then also to make sure that the monitoring and support can happen together as well. So at the end of the day, our goal is to ensure that all children are ready for school and grades one and two and further. So to do that, if we could actually have this collaboration implemented in letter and spirit, uh, then I feel that the recommendations of the policy would actually be implemented. The national education policy also talks about community participation. And this is something that's very uh, important. And in COVID years, I think almost uh, everyone across the country has seen how important it is to work with parents and volunteers. And in order to implement this, the recommendation that we would like to make is that partnerships with the community are as important as partnerships with the government. Without this partnership, especially in the younger, in the early years, it is not possible to achieve the kind of outcomes that we aspire for. And what does this partnership look like? Uh, I can share some examples from Pratham about what we do with parents and especially mothers. But I think every school system and Anganwadi system, uh, are they can be connected with parents, but they also need to think through what is it they need to do on a regular basis so that parents are involved and they support what happens in school back at home. So some examples that Pratham, uh, at Pratham we have tried and we are also scaling up with the government in some states uh, is to say that in communities um, during holidays and even when schools are on, it really helps to make groups of parents, especially mothers, across the communities. Uh, what this means is that for a certain amount of time, mothers groups meet and then they discuss and try to play some of the activities that are done in class. Parent-teacher meetings are equally important, but mothers leaning on each other to take forward the teaching learning for their children uh, is uh, extremely important. Having regular workshops, especially at schools for mothers, often when we talk to parents, they say that we don't know what it means um, uh, to learn in the early years. We do not know what it means to think about child safety. And so opening out what it means to use local resources to play, what it means to keep your children safe, what it means to learn in the early years, workshops conducted regularly by schools um, as much as possible uh, really helps for the community to partner with the school systems. It's also important to have mobilization drives to look uh, to make sure that children and parents are aware that they need to come to school. School readiness fairs in the community to see are children ready for school, are schools ready for children. Uh, these can be very interesting and exciting uh, uh, places to uh, open out play and learning. Um, sharing WhatsApp and SMS is something that we have learned to do over the years. We share the messages with mothers and then mothers understand the message and then they actually carry out the activity with their children. So now I will just share two practices which um, have been very exciting for our children and mothers in the uh, community. Uh, these are the school readiness fairs that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, here in the school readiness fairs, we have uh, a community where we mobilize all the volunteers, the siblings, all the adult stakeholders that we talked about, the parent, the teacher, the worker, the sibling, the college going person, all of them come together and we set up booths. Uh, by booth, I mean it's like a stall uh, where you could get some food to eat, uh, you could do some drawings, um, but for the early years, you would have each booth dedicated to a certain development. So you would have some activities for motor development at a booth and children and their mothers would come. They would try to do the activity and then they would go to the next booth on social emotional development. Maybe you need to recognize some expressions there or you need to tell us how do you, you know, what's the face you make when someone snatches something away from you. So you have these little activities uh, that happen uh, at the 
uh, booth for social emotional development. Then you go to the to stall for cognitive development where you separate out vegetables. Maybe you need to arrange things in sequence. Um, and then you come to a language stall where you may need to recognize letters or uh, look at uh, things in a poster and identify them or tell us a story. And then comes math. And so at the end of this um, entire fair for a child and his or her parent, there's a little report card which is filled in. It's a pictorial report card to see how the child is doing. And then some simple activities are shared with the parent so that we say that we'll do this in class, but you want to do this at home too. And because the parent has seen this at every stall, she knows what needs to be done at home now. And she knows that, you know, play in the early years is not just play. It's the best way to learn. And that's the part that we are opening out. We are also preparing them to say, you know, when you go to grade one, you want your children to know many of these things. That way they'll be able to cope with what happens in school. So. I have a couple of minutes left. OK, thank you. So this was my uh, example of a best practice uh, school readiness melas. And for everyone in Hindi, we say we call a fair a mela. And um, everyone who's listening and watching, you're invited to come to India uh, to our fair uh, and see how it's done in different states. Um, the second practice I want to share with you is a video. Um, and here you will see uh, mothers engaging with children in class and children using local resources uh, to learn in the community, in class and at home. So I'll request Ari to play the video for me. I'm going to take down my presentation now. So it seems that the video is, is um, watched, has been watched. And uh, thank you very much, Samyukta, for your absolutely gorgeous presentation. It was very elaborative and, and the examples of your ways to engage the parents were very informative. Um, for the remaining 15 minutes, we have a couple of questions in the chat, both for Tuovi and for Samyukta. And maybe Samyukta is having, uh, uh, do we still have you online? But I'll Good. try to join back so that my camera comes on. Just okay. give me a second. Yeah. Okay, so then okay. we will move onwards with Tuovi's question. So there was a particular question in the chat, which you probably already uh, saw, but I will read it aloud anyways. So the question was uh, the the question who the person asks, uh, says, thank you for sharing your wonderful examples of guided play and free play examples. But the question is, are there any ways that these free play or guided play activities 
uh, could be evaluated in terms of child outcome? Well, it's it's a difficult question. Maybe like when when Kati talked about the pedagogical documentation, uh, I think you could use the pedagog pedagogical documentation if we want to kind of evaluate like, but then we would talk about individual child and their skills or like, for example, if, if we have a child who has difficulties of sharing something or sharing with friends, following the rules, then you can easily kind of evaluate how he or she learns learns through play with guided play and free play. That's just about kind of observing the children while they're playing and then maybe intervening on the play while you are there if it looks like that they need help. But for example, like that, so there's so many skills, all the skills are the things that you can kind of assess in this way through the play and while they are play. I hope this answered at least a little bit on the question. Lovely. And perhaps just, you know, saying that there aren't hardly any ways to assess child outcomes in Finnish early child education, but Sati would like to make a note. Uh, I would like to point out that there are some forms you can use, for example, in evaluating children's well-being and involvement. And of course, both of those are very crucial to children's learning. So you can actually measure by using the Leuven scales from Fer Lavers, maybe you know him, uh, how well children in your class are being and how well they are involved in the activities and if those both things are uh, on a good level then you also can know that they have the best learning opportunities and this might be one way to evaluate their progress through play in place thank you thank you very much Kati. that was an excellent point being made um, I would then turn the question to Samyukta. There are two questions actually for you in the chat. And the first one is, uh, as you mentioned, um, early childhood education centers are very much women centric. There is very less to no role of the other genders, as you also mothers as it is the common belief that mothers are the primary caregivers what do you think is it something we should be facilitating to our children and how can we change this yes thank you for the question i'm afraid my camera does not want to cooperate with me today so <laughs> please bear with me uh, but that's a great question. Um, so I think, yes, it is commonly believed that uh, uh, mothers and children, especially at this young age, they spend a lot of time together. That does not mean that we should not work with fathers or grandparents. Quite often, often we see children with their grandparents um, and they spend time with their siblings. And I think we should look at all genders who come in contact with young children. The point to keep in mind, I think, is that while many interact with children, uh, there are some who influence children uh, in a big way. And, and uh, their decisions are therefore taken based on the person who is, you know, spending that time with them and influencing them. And because mothers and children spend so much time together, we feel that it's an important moment to recognize that teaching learning ha happens in all these interactions. There are those organizations that work with fathers, uh, work with fathers and uh, uh, how they can work with children. And I think that is equally important. But the, um, quite often we find that fathers play an important role, but are not able to give the kind of time that is required with children. So I think if we begin to work with fathers, we need to begin there to say what kind of time can they spend and then what is the quality of the time that they spend with the child. Thank you very much, Samyukta. Would, would other um, presenters like to produce their 
comment to this topic? I, I could say that uh, I'm a bit over 50 years of age now and I have grandchildren and I have been watching closely closely what is going on in Finnish family life nowadays. And during my lifetime, a big change has happened in our society. And we see totally different kind of fathers today than 20 years ago. So it's a big cultural question too, and also requires some support from the government, I think. Thank you, Kati. Um, there is one more question for Samyukta, which I probably should read now. Uh, so there are policies laid down for early years, but as mentioned by you, every state has a different scenario. Can decentralization of policies according to the needs of the stakeholders of each state can help in curbing few issues related to early years? Yes. Um, I think, yes, I think the important point uh, to be made was that decentralization is important. While the policy is at the national level, every state can uh, decide on what works best for them. Um, education is on the concurrent list uh, in the constitution. That means that both states and center can legislate on it. And so I think that if states could take into uh, account the the evidence that is there for their own states the data that is presenting itself and then take decisions uh, which they can take they are allowed to take um, in a decentralized way then i think the dif the paths may be different but then the goal can be achieved across the country What about Tuovi and Kati? Are there similarities in the Finnish society that should be taken into account, or do you recognize similar challenges? If not, then um, we are probably approaching towards the end of our webinar. Um, there is one more question that I would like to raise into the session after hearing your lovely presentations, your very experience, your, your, the way your um, experiences spoke within the presentation. It was amazing. Um, I was left to wonder what is the role of the very young children in the systems uh, in the Finnish early childhood education and in Indian early childhood education when we talk about the children who are and under the age of three. Well, I can, is it okay, Kathy, or do you, oh, I'll go first. Well, it, it depends, I think, it depends who you ask. There are a lot of people in, in Finland who think that the best place for a child under three years old is, is at home or place that feels like home and maybe not the daycare centers. I myself, I believe that there are so many things under three years old children that they can learn throughout the day in the daycare centers, the groups, as long as they are as small as the law requires. They are very safe places to learn social skills and many other skills. And I feel that younger the children are, the you can see the pedagogy and it should be seen in the with the bigger children as well. But you can see the pedagogy throughout the day. I think it starts when you come to the do the kindergarten and you start taking your outdoor clothes off and then you name different clothes. And it's kind of the learning happens all the time, especially with the younger children. Yes, that's true. And when we know that uh, the human brain develops most uh, before the age of six, so we can 
understand quite easily why it's so important to kind of fill the brains or build the connections in the brains uh, as well as we can. And of course, there is again the dilemma of high quality and not so good quality in early childhood education. Of course, we ca it's not, not useful to put our two years of old children to a bad quality kindergarten. So it's really important that we the, the education and all the environments and so on are good at, at the kindergarten. And also we know that uh, the early childhood education and care supports best those children and also those families who have some kind of problems, challenges in their lives. And the more there are problems, the important it's to uh, give the child an opportunity to learn and to be the part of the the uh, early childhood education structures and so on so there are many many important things they can get even if they are not even if they don't need kind of friends yet when they are two or two years old Thank you for these responses. Um, do we have some Yuk still online? Yes. Would you like to uh, add to the questions presented? <laughs> yes. So I think in uh, India, what we see now is that um, more and more children below the age of three are coming into Anganwadi's uh, play school centers. Uh, that's probably, there could be many reasons for that. Uh, also that parents are working, you know, uh, their children need to be taken care of. So the Anganwadi center is like a play center and a daycare center. And so children are already there. And for them to engage in these kind of activities is very, very useful. As long as the teacher knows uh, what to do with each age group and how children are progressing. Uh, quite often uh, dealing with multi-age children in the same class can be quite challenging. And so I think it's an issue of capacity and how many children are in class. But if they can engage in age appropriate activities, it, uh, it would be lots of fun for them and for the teacher. Thank you very much. Um, we still have uh, like two minutes uh, of our webinar time and perhaps uh, I would like to raise a few topics that kind of caught my eye while while listening to your your um, expert presentations. And what, what came to me was how delicate balance there is actually between the structures or, and and processes within the ECEC system, looking at how delicately these different policy making decisions and, and the concrete structures that there are in the society kind of, kind of determine how the ECEC is being implemented. And at the same time, we see that the, the kind of the strategy towards good quality ECEC and, and child-centered pedagogies runs through the processes. It runs through the, the curriculum. It runs through these good professionals, high, highly qualified professionals who know how to change the mindsets in ECEC towards seeing the child at the center of the attention. So maybe these are the thoughts that I, I am bringing, bringing with me and I hope that each and Everyone who has been listening has been able to create their own vision of Finnish and, and Indian ECEC. I thank you very much for taking part, and I hope that the discussion stays lively, perhaps through email or other avenues, also after this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you and good luck to your, you all with your efforts in early childhood education and it's really important the job you are doing. Thank you.